Half a day. After a dozen years of relative weather calm, Guam and our neighboring island of Rota were hit by Typhoon Delphin in May. And just this weekend, tropical storm Chanham passed through the area, blanketing the island with wind and rain, and the threat of another typhoon. In Guam and Micronesia, the last half of the year is coined typhoon season, although one could hit any time throughout the year. And currently, we are experiencing El Nino, which means we'll see a lot more storm activity. In this episode of In Focus, we'll meet experts who teach us what this means, what we can expect, and what we can do to prepare for what Mother Nature may bring our way. We don't have a, a, an official typhoon season, but for the most part, you could say it's from the middle 15th of July to the 15th of December. But our, but our typhoon season is heavily modulated by whether we're in an El Nino or a La Nina. If we're in an El Nino, it shifts the location where typhoons develop, and it shifts it to the east of us. And because of the spin of the earth and the shape of the earth, typhoons want to move from the southeast to the northwest. And, uh, and as they move from the southeast to the northwest, if they're east of us, southeast of us, they're gonna move right toward the Mariana Islands. So you can see, as long as we're in El Nino periods, we can see a lot of storm activity, we, like we did in the 1990s. And when we're in La Nina periods, you, you don't see very much, like we've seen over the last decade. So it's been fairly quiet over the last decade. So there are long periods where we don't have typhoons, and there's long periods where we have a lot of typhoon activity. We've been in a La Nina pattern for the most part uh, since the uh, early 2000s, right, since uh, Punxsana, really, uh, which hit us in December of 2002. Typhoon Karen swept across the island of Guam with disastrous fury. Winds of over 207 miles an hour were recorded. In the early 1960s, Guam was hit by a couple of typhoons, Karen and Olive, that would damage about 90% of structures on island. Super Typhoon Karen was in 1962, and Typhoon Olive followed in 63, prompting the United States Congress to pass the Rehabilitation Act, which would revolutionize the way people thought about how they built their homes and the territory's mandated construction methods. You know, uh, the strongest storm that we have on history uh, documented is uh, Typhoon Karen, and that hit in November 1962. Of course, most of the island was uh, wooden, and in those kind of dollars, I think it did about $250 million worth of damage. I remember back in the 60s, I was born in the early 60s, and during that time, we had Typhoon Karen. And during Typhoon Karen, many of our residents here in the north, I mean all over the island, lived in wooden tin structures uh, with famous uh, Quonset huts and A-frame homes. And... Um, Back then, of course, after Typhoon Karen, when many homes were destroyed, uh, Derido was a very small municipality, mostly of consisted of farm area. And because we had a lot of space, uh, what happened was uh, construction companies were hired. And one construction company in particular was Kaiser's, uh, Kaiser Cement Company. And that's where the creation of the Kaiser housing, because if you look all over the island, in Petey and Derido, we have Kaiser structured homes. And that's the areas around Maria Joa, Weddingale, and all of Liguan Terrace are Kaiser homes. Uh, of course, when they built the development, um, the, the building code for Guam started to change. They started to get more better quality homes. They were all prefabbed homes the same way that we're building homes now. You know, I thank our, our government uh, for assuring that our people are building stronger homes and, you know, um, continuing to follow the building codes. Our contractors are following the building codes. As infrastructure was hardened, so were many island residents resolved, who time and time again picked up after each storm and resumed life as usual, until the next storm. For those who have lived on island or grew up knowing typhoons, it's instinctive to board up property and make the necessary preparations once storm warnings are issued. 
Since there has been such a long interval from the last significant typhoon, there may have been those who were caught unaware. You know, Guam uh, hasn't had a really strong typhoon in over 12 years. Uh, so, of course, uh, those that just, you know, residents that have just moved to Guam or families that are just starting their own families, young families are trying to build their lives. And uh, when we look about structures that they're ready to build, um, sometimes we're not really aware of making sure that those structures are going to withstand a uh, certain uh, full force of winds, uh, winds such as anything over 100 miles per hour. Uh, so, you know, anything less than that would be considered like a banana typhoon, uh, meaning, you know, banana trees will just fall over. You know, we have the rhino beetles that have invaded most, a lot of trunks, coconut tree trunks. And, of course, the, they weakened the, the trees. And when we have weakened trees with heavy winds and a lot of rain, of course, the soils are, are loosened. And with the winds, you know, being as strong as they have been, uh, they were during Typhoon Dolphin, uh, you know, they, they just pushed the, the trees down. So how exactly do we know when a storm happens? When should we prepare? And who is involved in making decisions about conditions of readiness? Just like the National Hurricane Center does, we issue the, the typhoon watches and warnings. And of course, a watch means we expect damaging winds associated with either a tropical storm or a typhoon within, we say they're possible within the next 48 hours. As the storm moves closer and we have more confidence when uh, we put out a tropical storm or a typhoon warning, that means that we expect damaging winds either associated with the tropical storm or the typhoon. We expect those winds within the next 24 hours. When we go to uh, a watch the government of Guam will then call a heavy weather briefing and they will go to a uh, condition three. So based on our setting the watch, they will get together and the governor will determine when they go to, to condition of readiness three. When we set the warning, a few hours later they'll go to uh, condition of readiness two. Now, we base our watches and warnings on the arrival of winds. That's the meteorological information. So once we set a warning, then a few hours later, they'll probably go to, a, uh, uh, to core two, and then 12 hours after that, they'll go to core one. Guam Homeland Security plays a really crucial role with um, typhoon preparedness. Uh, our main mission here is to um, mitigate, prepare, uh, respond, and then recover from the, from the actual disaster. So for typhoon preparedness, for mitigation, we do have everyone here that plays a crucial role. We have critical infrastructure personnel, that's d -Cruise. She handles working with um, different agencies as far as uh, power and water um, in preparation for typhoons. So it starts with, um, even before the typhoon comes. And then as far as preparation, we also work very closely. We have um, a typhoon program manager, his name's Kenny Artero, and uh, he's responsible for um, ensuring that the typhoon program is, is ready and, and available for the community, and that's where the public affairs officer, my job is um, for community outreach, is to push that out to the public. So we go out and visit um, different schools, and we uh, attend different events where we push out information on typhoon preparedness, what to do before, during, and after a storm. The Joint Information Center is stood up um, as soon as the Homeland Security Advisor is um, advised by the governor. Um, this, is norm this normally happens whenever we move into typhoons of condition, uh, if we're going to move into conditions of readiness b beyond um, four. For the Joint Information Center is comprised of all different agencies, so public affairs officers with GovGuam agencies as well as our military partners from Joint Region Marianas, they come into the Joint Information Center, which is staged here at Guam Homeland Security, and we come together to um, collaborate and push out one voice, one message. That's kind of our mission here. Now the governor and the, uh, the admiral talk to each other uh, uh, a lot when we're going into these conditions of readiness. In the last few storms, we've actually had the same condition of readiness uh, set for the same time periods. That eliminates a lot of the confusion. On Anderson Air Force Base, weather flight forecasters also pay close watch around the clock for any disturbances. During Typhoon Dolphin, they provided critical information that allowed the island to better prepare. We have nine forecasters, um, and we sit here, or we're here 24-7, uh, monitoring the entire Pacific just for any development. We monitor uh, most of the Pacific um, just for 
any invests or any areas of disturbed weather that would uh, that look like they may develop into typhoons. Uh, we give advance warning to the, the base here um, at Anderson. We also collaborate with National Weather Service and um, JRM. When we're expecting a typhoon, uh, we analyze the models, the weather models that we have online. Um, we collaborate again with the National Weather Service, um, Joint Typhoon Warning Center, and JRM to kind of make sure that our forecasts all uh, go together there. The last typhoon that uh, hit the island, Typhoon Dolphin, we uh, uh, had consistent contact with the National Weather Service and the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. We wanted everyone on the island to uh, know that it was going to be uh, potentially worse than was a first forecast uh, earlier on in the day due to uh, where the center of the storm was and the, the new track that it was taking. Earlier on in the day, the storm was forecasted to go further north than it actually did. The forecast that we had was about 60 or 70 miles an hour. Um, what we actually ended up getting with the new track was 106 miles an hour up here, uh, a little bit less down on the southern part of the island. Uh, during the storm, it was uh, myself and Senior Emmer Brown. We were here at the shop. We uh, saw the whole thing on, on our radar. We uh, reported to the base leadership uh, the different wind speeds that we were recording so that they could uh, change T-cores at the correct times uh, and keeping uh, good contact with the, the government and the Navy base. The island's village mayors are the pulse of the community. During storms and other disasters, mayors are most residents' lifelines. Dededo Village Mayor Savaris shares some practical tips on how to best get ready for any storm. So of course, uh, when preparing for a storm, uh, we always, you know, think about what are important documents. It's got to be a first. Uh, make sure that all important documents, the way safe way, I always think that the safe way to keep it um, protected is put it in a Ziploc bag. Passports, birth certificates, any, uh, you know, uh, other important documents, shot records, put them in a Ziploc bag because Ziplocs are, are you know, st strong, uh, thick plastic, and then, you know, put it in between uh, mattresses or, or something where it's safe. If you have a, a cabinet that's a filing cabinet, uh, put it in there so that even if the rain, uh, the, your roof goes, the documents are going to be dry when you need them. Keep clothing away from windows. Uh, you know, if you feel that maybe you're going to have problems if uh, sh you don't have shutters on your windows, keep anything that you will need, maybe clothing, uh, uh, bedding, mattresses, pillows, uh, away from windows where, or doors where water may come through. So for food, if you have frozen foods, uh, make sure your freezers are kept shut because if you keep opening and closing, of course, it, it'll tend to let warm air in and defrost your frozen foods. Uh, keep a lot of canned goods in stock. Another thing that you need to be aware is have a lot of water. Uh, not Try and hunt to drink soda, uh, you know, sweet drinks during a storm. You want to make sure you have drinking water to hydrate uh, yourselves and your families. Um, of course, you know, many people nowadays with technology want to always have their phones charged and, and uh, so that kids can be entertained with their base stations, Xboxes, uh, um, iPads. But, you know, board games, things that families can do together. Uh, if you don't have a board game, play t make something up. Do family things so that the kids are entertained and don't get restless. Another thing is uh, many years ago after a storm, we found, you know, we had problems with fuel, gas for our cars. Uh, before a storm, when you know a storm is coming, please uh, make sure your, your car tanks are filled. Because of the multi-organizational approach, the One Guam concerted effort among local, federal, and military partners, we are better able to track and prepare for typhoons. But also as important is the sense of community we have. Our communities are, are just more um, resilient when it comes to uh, preparing their families to be in a safe environment as well. You know, our families stick together. They, they assure that um, the, their families, young and old, are going to be in a safe structure, uh, no matter what the, the disaster is going to be.